dyrektorem programowym tego festiwalu i bardzo, bardzo, ale to bardzo się cieszę, że możemy przywitać Carmen Marię Machado. Moja przygoda z jej twórczością, z jej pisarstwem zaczęła się od komiksu zatytułowanego Pośród lasu. On się ukazał także w języku polskim. To jest komiks przygotowany do takiej serii zatytułowanej Hill House, którą nadzorował, którą wymyślił Joe Hill dla wydawnictwa DC. Byłem zachwycony zarówno scenariuszem, jak i stroną wizualną tej powieści graficznej. Potem przeczytałem jej ciało inne strony i wreszcie ostatnią książkę po polsku wydaną, jako ostatnia, jako trzecia w domu snów. To wszystko, co Carmen Maria Machado robi w literaturze, wydaje mi się niezwykle inspirujące, intrygujące i nieoczywiste. Ta książka ostatnia przeze mnie wymieniona, wymieniona, czyli W domu snów, to opowieść o skomplikowanej relacji dwóch kobiet, relacja, relacji pełnej przemocy. I w ten sposób można by opowiedzieć, o czym to jest, niby proste. Ale kiedy zaczynamy czytać tę książkę, to nic nie jest w tym oczywiste przez co forma tej książki staje się dla nas coraz bardziej zrozumiała. Każdy z rozdziałów tego memuaru jest napisany innym stylem, dlatego że istota tego doświadczenia nieustannie się wymyka. Byłem tym absolutnie zachwycony. Pomyślałem, że to fantastyczna literatura dla festiwalu Konrada i dlatego zdecydowałem się zaprosić Carmen do nas w tym roku. Spotkanie poprowadził Aldona Kobus, która już u nas wczoraj wystąpiła. Prowadziła jedną z naszych pięciu queerowych lekcji czytania. Od poniedziałku prezentowaliśmy literaturę zarówno osób LGBTQA+, jak i literaturę prezentowaną przez osoby LGBTQA+, dla uczniów, uczennic, osób uczących się w szkołach średnich. Aldona poprowadziła tę lekcję wczoraj, bardzo jej za to dziękuję. Dla Państwa symultanicznie spotkanie będzie tłumaczone przez Bartosza Krajkę oraz Piotra Krasnowolskiego, natomiast na polski język migowy spotkanie tłumaczy pani Anna Pieniążek. Przywitajmy wszystkich bardzo gromkim brawami. Hello and welcome to Krakow. Okej, okay, ja będę mówiła po e, polsku. Chcę także powiedzieć, że po spotkaniu odbędzie się podpisywanie e, książek i Karmen będzie rozdawała autografy w foyer e, przy stoisku z książkami. Także spokojnie, wszyscy mają okazję dostać podpis. E, Okej, okay. zaczynając od może całości twojej twórczości, całokształtu. E, czytając twoje opowiadania i powieść, miałam takie uczucie podobne jak przy lekturze Shirley Jackson. Jak gdybyś odsłaniała demoniczną, niemal dystopijną stronę rzeczywistości. W tym sensie, że ta dystopia nie pochodzi z jakiegoś kataklizmu, nie ma charakteru postapokaliptycznego, ale z takim odsłonięciem banalności codziennego zła. To było bardzo widoczne, zwłaszcza w mężowskim świe, The Husband Stage, gdzie jakby źródłem tragedii były narastające mikroagresje. Co takiego w naszej rzeczywistości daje to poczucie grozy, jest tym źródłem horroru? Thank you. Also, hello everybody. I'm so glad to be here. Um, so, I feel like for me, it's funny because when I was growing up, I read a lot of, I read a lot of horror. I read a lot of science fiction. You know, I was actually really interested in like, you know. I think what you call like dystopian literature, sort of big picture horror. Um, but when I sat down to sort of write my own work, I always find myself returning to everyday evil. I think because, I mean, for, I don't know, a million reasons, even my story in my first book, Inventory, which actually you know, I wrote and published in English in 2017, um, is about a pandemic and about, in that case, um, trying to date and being horny during a pandemic. You know, so not not something that I'm sure nobody here knows what that is like at all. <laughs> um, anyway, so I feel like even that story, which is taking place on this like major scale, like there is in the background this huge thing moving across the you know the world and the country. There's still I was still interested in like the minutia of it. So not 
like what does it mean for like millions of people to be dying or you know all this stuff to be happening but like what does it mean when human beings who are meant to be with each other who are meant to be social who are meant to be intimate with each other cannot do that or they do so at great peril um, and so for me I think just like intimacy and like moments between people and the ways that it can be good and also evil and terrifying is just the thing that I'm most interested in as a writer. It's just, for some reason, it's the thing that I always return to. I mean, I like big picture dystopia and things like that, but I just feel like that intimacy is what's the most interesting to me. Momenty intymności są tymi, kiedy ludzie są najbardziej bezbronni, czy najbardziej potężni, więc to jest ekstremalnie dwuznaczna sytuacja w kontaktach międzyludzkich. Przepraszam, zacięłam się. Zdarza się najlepszym. E, te momenty intymności u ciebie też pojawiają się bardzo często, są się wygłodnym tym tematem w zasadzie w Domu Snów, gdzie mamy do czynienia ze stopniowym rozkładem niemal idealistycznego związku. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just like, that's like very dark, but I love it. Um, <laughs> it's true. I mean, I think for me, I mean, for that book especially, I was really interested in, it's, it's hard because it's like in real life, I want to be an optimist. Like I want to believe in the best, in that things will work out and I want to believe that things are good. Unfortunately, I'm proven that has been sort of beat out of me by both just existing in the world. I mean, I'm 36 years old. I feel like when I was 22, I believed that, that you know, everything was going to be okay and that like, you could fight for what was right. And like, unfortunately, I become very cynical in my, in my old age. Um, I am just uh, <laughs> pretty pessimistic about the world in general. And I think, you know, in terms of the dream house and in terms of that memoir, you know, I was, it was, you know, I talk in the book about how you know, in queerness, we have these sort of, especially with like lesbians and queer women, there's this sort of narrative of idealism. There's this narrative of like, and I think that makes sense because I think if you're gay and you spend your, if you're like a queer woman, for example, and you, you, gr you grow up like dating men and being like, what is wrong with me? And then you figure it out and you're like, oh, you know, and then it's like dating women is great and very exciting um, and you feel good about it. It then, you know, there's this way in which that can feel like paradise. It feels perfect. It feels like, you know, but of course people are people and like people are capable of hurting other people regardless of how they identify sort of sexually or their gender or whatever. And so I think for me, a lot of, a lot of that book is about, you know, approaching the idealistic state, like approaching, um, this sense of promise and acknowledging that it can be really beautiful and wonderful and it can also be very sad and that people of all kinds are capable of hurting each other. And so again, it's like that, that idealism of my, of my youth and the pessimism of I think just being a person in the world and things kind of, you know, happening like they do. Nawiązując do e, tematu tegorocznego festiwalu Konrada, czyli do wspólnot, dużo w Domu Snów jest takiego napięcia pomiędzy tym, co bardzo osobiste i intymne, pomiędzy, pomiędzy pamiętnikarstwem i memuarem, a taką dystansującą narracją eseistyczną, e, gdzie właśnie rozważasz kwestie reprezentacji przede wszystkim i tego, jak publikowanie tego rodzaju historii odbije się na wizerunku osób queerowych, które też rozpoczwie tej idealizacji w mediach potrzebują? Czy czujesz takie poczucie zobowiązania wobec wspólnoty? Yeah, I mean the pressure, the pressure of the community is, was weighing on me so heavily when I was writing that book that it, I mean it created in me a deep anxiety that I, I, I have never quite shaken. And I mean, I've been lucky in that like, for the most part, the book has been very well received. You know, I still get, I mean, the book came out in, in the, the US in 2019 and I still get easily 20 messages a week, a minimum from people who have read it, who have said it really spoke to them, really helped them. So in that sense, I do feel like there was something about my community that I was trying to help, you know. Um, 
but also the anxiety that I had about representing my community to non-queer people in this way was very stressful. And I thought about it a lot. And if you read like the afterword at the back of the book, you can sort of see me, you know, kind of turning that over and trying to kind of, you know, explain. Um, and there's also this really strange thing that happened which I think about every single day, which is when I was touring the book in the US, I was in, I think, Seattle or Portland maybe, and this elder lesbian stood up at the event. She had to have been in her 80s, I'm guessing. And she's, you know, she was like, thank you so much for writing this book. It's really special to hear you talk about it. And she said, you know, I feel like we try to break the silence on this subject every 10 years or so. And I really hope it takes this time. And I was like, thank you for saying that. And then I went back to my hotel and I cried for like two hours because it was so sad. And it was this way in which I was sort of having a recognition of like what my community needed. And also that like, I had been so worried about misrepresenting it. It had never occurred to me that I couldn't help it at all. So I feel like there's just this like real anxiety and stress around it that I've never quite reconciled. Um, it's a huge part of my life. I mean, it's a huge part of my um, thought process around the book, but I mean, I also did the thing I had to do, which was write the book, and then everything else after that, I feel like I can't control. So. Historia przedstawiania osób w queerowych mediach oscyluje pomiędzy totalną demonizacją a totalną idealizacją w ramach wynagrodzenia tego. A twoja książka zostawia osobom queerowym miejsc, miejsce na bycie po prostu człowiekiem, ponieważ idealizacja też jest formą dehumanizacji. Kobiety podlegają nieustannej idealizacji i demonizacji, queerowe kobiety doświadczają tego do tej potęgi. Yeah, I mean, I think that this desire I mean, you're absolutely correct. I mean, that's a, I can't even say it more succinctly than that. I think it's like idealization is also a form of dehumanization and saying that like lesbians aren't capable of hurting each other is like, in, we're, we're, we're all like an insane sentence to say and not true and also, right, deeply dehumanizing. And I think, you know, in that book, I kept being drawn back to this idea of like, what do we lose when we idealize relationships? What do we lose when we say, it's not possible for like lesbians to abuse each other or gay men to abuse each other. Like what is sort of lost in that process? Um, and yeah, that just, and it was funny because when I first started writing the book, I don't think that had fully occurred to me. I mean, so much of that book and doing the research that I was doing was realizing, like having a series of revelations about the way that we talk about queerness, the way that we talk about gender, especially as gender relates to things like race and queerness and gender identity and violence and like that we have like created these like weird narratives that then sort of trap women, both make them like, right, sort of inf infantilize them or dehumanize them and then also like trap people in these cycles where they, a thing is happening to them and they don't understand it because they have no way of understanding the context of what's happening, which is also an incredible form of dehumanization and violence. So it just seems like maybe we shouldn't do that to Joanna Raz chyba napisała, że jeśli uczynimy coś niemożliwym do nazwania, uczynimy to niemożliwym do pomyślenia. I to doskonale ilustruje sytuację wielu kobiecych doświadczeń. E, czy to stąd była to, było to zmaganie z formą w domu słów, to poszukiwanie gatunku zdolnego wypowiedzieć te doświadczenia? Yeah, I mean, you know, when I started writing that book, I... Well, I mean, before I was even writing a book, when I was just trying to write about what had happened, I was really struggling because I would write something and I would, it would just be like, what happened? And I would read it back to myself and I'd be like, oh, it's so boring. Like, it was so boring. I was like, I would not read this for one second. Like, this is horrible. Um, and it was weird because I'm not used to like putting all that material down on the page and because you know I read everything out loud to myself and I feel like that's how I get a sense of something kind of being alive or working like as like sentences or paragraphs or stories or whatever there's this sense of life and I was just getting nothing and I was like oh god okay I guess not and I, I also wrote several short stories in which like domestic violence in a lesbian relationship was at the center of the story. Um, so it's not like I wasn't writing about it, but like when I tried nonfiction, it was really hard. Um, and then, yeah, and then at some point, I think I began to, I mean, I began to think about things like haunted houses, horror, exorcisms, demonic possession. Like I was thinking about these different genres and what those genres in terms of their tropes 
offered to readers and decided to try and write some sort of sections of it in this style, so thinking about genre as like an organizing principle. And it was amazing, it was like once I did that, the whole thing just came to life. It was, it was crazy, like I, I was like wow, I suddenly feel like there's actually a book here, which I had not felt before. And I mean, it was still really early in the process and at that point I hadn't done any research or anything, but just even getting down the like personal material onto the page using genre, it was like really fast after that. I always joke that it's like um, like a wet baby giraffe, like it fell really far and it's like disgusting, but it like has all the parts it needs and you're like, oh, you're gonna be a big giraffe one day. You're not yet, you're gross now, but you'll be a big giraffe one day. So it was really helpful to like, I think go through that process and realize that genre, like that was the key, was like thinking about it in these formal ways and thinking about it as like, the story like infecting the genre. It's like there's like this infection that's happening where it's like what is happening is so powerful, it's like infecting the text and the text is like shaping around these like genre ideas. So yeah, it just, or like rupturing or something. So yeah, for some reason like that was the key and it was the key that I needed to get into the book. E, czy jest jakaś, e, ul, jakiś ulubiony gatunek, w którym wypowiedziałaś się w Domu Słów, ulubiona część? Bo dla mnie to jest e, przypowieść a na poły bajka o księżnicy i kołamarnicy, królowej kołamarnicy. Oh, yeah. The Queen and the Squid section was really interesting, actually, because, so, <coughs> so, I had written, okay, I, so, at the end of my relationship, my ex-girlfriend had sent me many emails, like many emails, and, there was so much text in them and I was like, and they were really insane. And I was like, there's something about the way these are written. I, a friend of mine called it um, a dying wizard email. It's like a wizard that's dying and he's like firing off spells in every direction. And it was like that. It was like the, all these techniques being trying to, trying to be executed, all, but all at once, so it didn't make any sense. And so I was like, so I took all the emails, I put them into a single document, I broke them down by sentences and then I alphabetized them. So it was like a million emails all at once, all organized by sentence and you could see like how many began with the word I, like how many began with, you know, like it was just kind of an interesting way of, of looking at them. And I was so proud. I was like, oh, this is great. This is so funny. It's like formally interesting. It's like amazing. And my editor was like, you can't do this. Like you can't publish, you can't publish even transformed this way. You cannot publish someone else's emails in your book without their permission. And I was like, oh God, okay. Well now what do I do? Cause I, I but I, but I liked the idea of it. Like I felt like there was something about this moment in the relationship, like at the moment where I was beginning to like pull away and I could like see it really clearly for what it was, or I was beginning to see it clearly. And so then I was like, well, now what do I do? I can't use these emails. And so I decided, so I just was like, what if I tried like a fairy tale? But I was like, well, what fairy tale? And I'd already used Bluebeard and I'd already talked about a few other fairy tales in the book. And then I decided to try and invent my own. And so I just, for some reason, I imagined myself as a squid. Um, and her as this queen and like that just became like the framework of it and I sort of wrote it sort of telling the story without telling the story um, and again it was like a weird experiment and it worked or it felt like I mean I guess I'll you can tell me if it worked but I think it worked um, and I really liked being able to um, tell the story without telling the story and there's a little bit of like and you can see there are like little fragments of ways that she spoke to me in those emails like in the in the fairy tale itself but for the most part you know, it's like me just trying to like approximate it. And I think I did a pretty good job. So, I don't know. It was a great job. Jeszcze jedną ciekawą rzeczą, którą można zauważyć w Domu Snów jest to, że użyłaś też a propos bajek jako formy ludowej, elementów folkloru, użyłaś właśnie indeksu motywów folklorystycznych Thompsona. I to jest ciekawy sposób na podawanie tych motywów w stosunku do bardzo specyficznych sytuacji po to, żeby je uniwersalizować, odnieść je do jakiegoś szerokiego kontekstu kulturowego. Tak, 
Yeah, I mean, that was that was sort of the intention. I mean, that text in particular, so the Thompson Sith index motif of motif of folklore, whatever it is, it's like, it, now I only had a PDF of it. It was like, it's like a thousand pages. It's or like more than a thousand. It's like this massive, I think multi-volume series that only existed at like three libraries in the United States. And I just found some blessed soul had uh, digitally uploaded it. So I just downloaded my own copy. And it was funny because I had been sort of looking at folktale taxonomy for other purposes in the book. Like, and because the, there are like many different scholars who have tried different ways of like organizing folktales and fairy tales by motif or by trope or whatever. Um, and so I, this, but this book was so specific. That's what I liked about it was it was so detailed and it felt like it contained every single trope that you could possibly conceive of in any kind of folklore or fairy tale. And I would go through it just sometimes like in the evenings because, you know, writing the book was very difficult and very sad. Sometimes I would like get a little drunk and I would just read through that document. Like I would just read through the, because it was just like so funny and so specific. And then occasionally I would find one that I liked and I would highlight it or I'd make a note or I'd write it down somewhere. And then I could go back and, you know, think about if it could fit in the book somewhere. But it was really funny because it just also gave me these opportunities, right, to like, well, A, to, first of all, to like make little jokes so like, you know, there was one that I laughed, I laughed so hard. It was, it was, um, this was the trope. It was, I have, liar says, I have no time to lie today, lies anyway. Which I was just like, perfect, it's great. I love it, and I wrote that down. And then, um, but yeah, but then also in addition to them being just kind of funny, I feel like there was something about the way in which, you know, I was, when I wrote, part of the reason I wrote the book is because I went looking for books like it. I was like, I know there are books about domestic violence, like they obviously exist, but like like memoirs, but there weren't any about, as far as I could tell, about any queer relationship of any kind. And I found like a couple of essays, a couple of, like a book of poetry, a Canadian poet, but mostly I couldn't find anything. And so it was tricky because I wanted to contextualize myself, I mean, which is what we are all doing all the time when we read, or well, it's one of the things we're doing when we read, is like, where do we fit in the world? Like, where do we fit, you know? And it would just, it just, it seemed to me that there was something really interesting in there about my own context that I had to figure out. But then the question was like, how do I, how do I find a space in a place I've not been given space to be in, right? And so it's like trying, and like also like I'm not an academic, I'm not a scholar, that's not my background. And so it was also tricky trying to figure out like how do I fit in these legal documents and where do I fit in the history and where do I fit? I mean, it was just this constant process. Um, and then eventually it became helpful um, yeah, the fairy tales became a way of thinking like more universally about the experience, which is like, well, maybe I haven't, no one's written a book like this before, and maybe it's really hard to find like sources about queer domestic violence, but also a liar has said to me, I have no time to lie today and has lied anyway, right? And like in that, in that way, I exist in this like continuum of like folklore, which is like really interesting. So there was just something about that that felt very like soothing almost or comforting um, and just became this like very fun little piece of the book that, I mean, fun is a strong word and it was fun, but it was less stressful than a lot of the other things I was doing around the book, so. To jest strasznie jest zabawne. E, natomiast e, wracam się do tego, znowu wracam do tej kwestii e, reprezentacji i idealizacji, bo też e, ona została utrwalona między innymi przez akademię i przez feministyczne e, filozofki, myślicielki, krytyczki, poczynając od Adrian Rich i jej e, idei lesbijskiego kontinuum, przez Iw Kowalski Sedwicz i jej e, teorii przejścia w, w społecznościach kobiecych płynnego od homospołeczności do homoerotyczności i tak dalej, i tak dalej. Poczęło się mi do tego, że kobieca erotyka jest zawsze równościowa, jest łagodna, nie jest wyzyskująca, związki lesbijskie są zawsze równościowe, nie ma wyzysku w tych rodzajach związkach, jakby były wolne od patriarchatu, czyli od kultury, w której istnieją. Ale z drugiej strony mamy też takie popkulturowe przedstawienie zupełnie czegoś innego, czyli związku queerowego kobiet jako inherentnie toksycznego i przemocowego, co też było widoczne chociażby w palkpowych powieściach lesbijskich, gatunku zresztą też wykorzystałaś w Domu Snów. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think this is the tension, right? Is that it's like media representation is sort of always going to be imperfect, and I think that, and I think that just in general, like I'm always looking as a writer and a thinker to like figure out. Like I feel like getting older and being because just just coming into myself as like a thinker and a writer is like realizing how insufficient sort of like discourse and narratives around around I mean queer, everything but also like queerness is is how like sort of insufficient it is. So I actually just did an event recently in New York and um, where we talked about this essay I had written about this movie Jennifer's Body that I really love and the essay that I had written is about this concept of queer baiting. So this idea that like it's bad for media to exist about queer people that does not explicitly label them as queer. Um, and like not having any patience for narratives that include queer subtext. And you know, for me it's like, you know, I feel like there's just something so sort of beautiful about subtext. And I feel like there's something, like a lot of the media that people say is like not is like is like doing this thing is that, that it, the idea that it's bad it's like no 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 it's just it, you can have like representations that are like complicated i mean that's actually is the most interesting like i'd way rather see like a complicated real looking relationship exist on the screen or the page or whatever than i would like a super idealized one or a super demonized one right and like that level of subtlety that level of ambiguity like that's I don't know, that makes the best art. Like, it's just like, I don't, I don't know what else to say. Like, that's just how, that's the best art. Um, so yeah, I, I just think for me, that's become just like such a sweet spot for me. It's just a, pl a pleasure point where I'm like, that's the, that's the kind of art I wanna make. It's the kind of art I wanna be consuming and reading and, and watching. Um, but I feel like for some reason, people just don't have a lot of patience for it, or at least, I mean, I, I'm, trying, I'm trying not to say young people these days. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying that, though I do feel it sometimes in my in my bones. Um, mostly when I'm on TikTok, I'm just like, what is happening? But uh, yeah, I feel like there is something about like we we we're losing patience and tolerance for these like narratives of of subtlety and subtext. When I, in fact, I think we should be leaning into those narratives. Like they they to me feel the most potent and the most interesting. So. To właśnie dać w takich terminach jak queerbaiting czy problematyczny, takie słowo wytrych, które teraz pojawia się w właśnie dyskursie internetowym, jak społecznościowych. A, a mnie bardzo poruszyło to, co pisałaś właśnie w Domu Snów o chociażby złoczyńcach z Disneya, tym jak Skaza albo Urszula byli w stanie uwodzić publiczność swoją dwuznacznością. Bo kiedy ja osobiście myślę o tym, jaką lesbijką chcę być, to jest moim ideałem, e, moim takim modelem, to przychodzi mi do głowy hrabina Zeleńska z córki Drakuli, spowita w czarną szatę, z diamentów, stojąca krew młodych kobiet. Nie oceniajcie. I will not judge you. That's hot. <laughs> is there a question in there? Is just how hot that is? Is that just what we're talking about here? <laughs> it was just a brag. <laughs> no, there is... A I'm switching languages all the time. The, the, jest tam pytanie, ponieważ e, twoje bohaterki kobiece też są same w sobie bardzo ambiwalentne. One są jednocześnie, chociażby by, e, główna postać w rezydence, jedną z moich ulubionych opowiadań, która jest jak wykrystalizowana Shirley Jackson, naprawdę. E, jest jednocześnie jakby ofiarą, ale też potworem na końcu tej książki. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's like hard to say without saying like, I am a monster and I am the villain at the end of at the book, you know, like, but like the resident is a funny example because I mean, you're not, it's like fiction is weird because it's like the character, the main character in that story, she's not me exactly, but she's close. Like she's, she's sort of like me like turned up to 11, like she's like, because I feel like the way that she has these like thought spirals and the way that she's really weird and the thoughts she's having are like my thoughts. And so much of that story, which is, you know, ultimately a lot of questions about like representation and about like, what does it mean? She mentions that she's writing this like 
story and then another woman says oh like so you're writing a mad woman in the attic story like that's so done that's so we're so over that like feminism is over that like why would you write that story and that is like literally a conversation that I've had in real life with someone and I became really interested in this question and so so much of that story I mean what's happening in it literally is not what happened to me I mean I've been to a residency and I've been to Girl Scouts uh, you know I was I, but like I mean most of what's happened there is fiction but the thoughts are my thoughts, and like the character is very much like me, if not a little more neurotic, but not by much. Like she's close. And I remember the first time I ever like workshopped that story, someone was like, "Well, this woman is crazy," and I was like, "Yeah, I get, yeah, um, yeah," you know, <laughs> uh, because that I that I was feeling very weird about that. Um, I've like lost my th my thread. Oh, anyway, so I feel like there is something about. Um, I've already forgotten the question. You asked me about the resident and I got totally sidetracked. Wait, what was the question? Uh, o ambivalentnym traktowaniu kobiecości w twojej twórczości. Oh, right, okay, yeah. So I mean, basically it's like, I feel like that's just, that's just sort of me. And I feel like th that sensation of like not being, a like I feel like that that is just me. Like I feel like that's just like my relationship with like myself and also with, with the women in my life. And again, to me, this desire to demonize and idealize are both kind of boring. And I feel like that kind of ambivalence and that kind of, like I feel like the ability to be weird, like you mentioned Shirley Jackson, were you talking about like Eleanor and Haunting of Hill House or just in general? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, Eleanor is like one of my favorite characters in literature and she is so interesting because she's so fucking weird and the whole time you're like, girl, what are you doing? Like, what is happening right now? And every, you could tell that everyone around her is like, what is going on with this person? She's so strange. And like, I really like how weird she is. And I like how unconcerned she is with being liked. I mean, she sort of wants Theo to like her because she's got a crush on Theo, but like, because she's a great early lesbian protagonist. But like, she's mostly just sort of like trying to figure out who she is and where she goes. Again, a question of context. And to me, that is a far more interesting question than like these sort of fake narratives of like someone being like sort of evil or wicked or also like very sweet and good. And like, I feel like for some reason people get really, it's like they're trying to overcorrect from like the demonization of like queer women in, in literature and they're overcorrecting into this like idealized sort of representation. And I'm like, but that's also boring. That's also very bad. Like honestly, villains are more interesting than good characters and also ambivalent characters are the most interesting of all in my opinion. So yeah, that just, I think just became like the way that I wanted to write and the characters that seemed the most interesting to me. E, także to, że właśnie w tym patriarchalnym świecie mikroagresji i przemocy, która przenika do wnętrza, e, do naszych ciał, do naszych dusz, naszych umysłów, co też bardzo widoczne jest w twojej twórczości na każdym kroku, w każdym opowiadaniu, w każdym tekście, e, jako taki stały powracający temat, w tym świecie bycie kobietą jest bycie praktycznie potworem, ponieważ patriarchat konstruuje coś jako coś potwornego, niepożądanego, coś najgorszego, co może spotkać człowieka. Tak, mężczyzna budzi się codziennie i dziękuję Bogu, że nie jest kobietą. Ktoś tak robił naprawdę. E, I jednocześnie jest czymś właśnie e, idealizowanym i, i przedstawianym jako coś wartego chronienia, takim wiktymizowanym wręcz. E, musimy chronić nasze kobiety. Ale też pytanie, kto jest wtedy prawdziwą kobietą, bo w tym momencie na przykład po polskich mediach społecznościowych chodzi mem, który głosi, że kobieta kończy się na 60 kg. I w takim razie co z całą resztą kobiet, które są 61 zwyż? Czy już nie są kobietami, a jeśli nie, to czym są? Oh my God, there's like so, I have so many thoughts about what you just said and I don't even know where to start. Um, I mean, I feel like the it's so interesting to me because I feel like on some level, it's like there's a tension I think in my work, which is also a tension that exists in my mind, which is I am both furious at men and patriarchy, and I also do not care about men at all. So it's this like weird tension of like, I, I, it's like I don't, it's like there's a, a reality of my life, which is that like everything that I do, 
even though I like do not it's like whatever I'm I'm gay like I mean whatever there are men in my life men who I love very much but like for the most part like I don't my day-to-day -day life in terms of like my work and my personal relationships like are not really shaped by male interaction by design um but also patriarchy infects every inch of what I do. It is like an infection that I cannot get out of my body and it is in the water and it is in the air and like there's nothing that I can do to escape it and it will be there until I die. And I like understand this and I recognize this. Um, and so I feel like for me there's this weird energy where it's like I'm both so focused on it in my writing because it is this reality of my life and this reality of my existence that shapes my art, it shapes my everything. Um, and then there's also this piece of it where I'm like, it's just something I don't want to think about, like I'm just not, but it like comes back, you know? So like, I mean, in my graphic novel, which is another sort of, you know, the low, I don't know, sorry, the transition I think was different in, in, in Polish, but the low, low woods, the graphic novel that I did for Joe Hill, um, you know, that began as a story about like, this weird mystery. It was like a dream that I had about these girls sort of waking up and not remembering something that had happened to them. And I remember like n literally not knowing where it was going and then eventually becomes this like, you know, this, I don't want to like spoil anything, but there's this, this narrative about like the way that patriarchy kind of functions in that case, like in a small town and the way that like these sort of conspiracies of gender, uh, you know, emerge in closed systems. Um, and so it, it was like weird because I was kind of mad at myself because I was like, I actually don't want to be writing about this all the time. Like I don't want my brand to become between that and like the husband stitch. I don't want my brand to be like men are evil because I honestly, it, because I'm like, it's not that men aren't, you know, whatever. It's like patriarchy, patriarchy is evil, but I also don't want to be writing about patriarchy all the time. That's very boring. You know, like I want to be writing about other things, but it's like, I can't escape it. I can't elude it. Like it's just kind of constantly behind me, like breathing in my ear. Um, and I don't really know what to do about that. Like I, you know, and I feel like for me, it's like still trying, I'm still trying to figure out, you know, like where that, I mean, I guess in some ways, like I remember one time I, Oh, in my, the, the short story in my first book, um, Eight Bites, which I remember when I, I had actually written it for an anthology and the editor said to me, you know, it's really weird how there's no men in this story. And I was like, is it weird? And he was like, well, because, you know, there's like a mother and a daughter, so like, presumably there was a father. And I was like, well... Okay, like, sure, um, but I don't really care. And he just like, kept kind of, be, it was like, so unrealistic and he like couldn't get over it. And eventually I pulled the story from the anthology and just put it in my book. But like, you know, I was just sort of like, it isn't that I, I just didn't care. and It just wasn't a part of the story. I was like, that was a story about mothers and daughters and bodies. And like, even though like the reality, and that's a story about fatness and about weight. And so, you know, I was like, in, that patriarchy is implicated in that dialogue certainly but like this is a story about mothers and daughters and b conversations about bodies and like that's what that story is about it has nothing to do like there's n there's no men in the story because it doesn't matter it, it doesn't, I don't care and so I feel like it's just like a very weird dynamic where I'm constantly trying to figure out like what is my relationship with gender um and like what is my relationship not I mean my own gender but also just like thinking about like thinking about yeah like what that role is in my work and I feel like I, I haven't quite I mean I haven't figured it out yet I guess, because um, I feel like it's both, you know. You are young, you still have time. What was this? <laughs> <laughs> I both feel, it's like one of those things where like, I, I know that I'm young, I'm 36, like I'm, I'm young, and also I feel like, especially after COVID, I feel so old. I feel like I'm about to, I'm about to turn to dust right now. Like that is, <laughs> that is just because I just, I don't know, I... Tak samo jak e, liczymy w psich i ludzkich latach, no liczyć się w latach normalnych i covidowych. I każdy rok covida to jest 10 lat. Mentalnie. I mean, I think, I think it's like, it's funny because I've been saying like I'm 36, but I'm 34 in covid years because like I lost <laughs> two years of my life. But I feel like thinking of it like mentally is like, right, it was like adding years in like in my head. That totally makes sense to me. That feels correct, yeah. W ośmiu kęsach nie ma mężczyzn bezpośrednio, ale jest taka kultura mikrozarządzania kobiecym ciałem i kontroli kobiecej cielesności jako strategii kontroli kobiet. Ta obsesja właśnie wagi i wyglądu. Więc nawet jeśli tych mężczyzn nie ma tam bezpośrednio, to jest tam wciąż wprogramowana w kobietę od urodzenia w zasadzie potrzeba nieustannej kontroli swojej wagi.
mężczyzna bezpośrednio nie musi tam być, żeby była kultura, która go reprezentuje. Right, and this is the thing, right? It's, so it's like even when they're not explicitly there, these systems, these patriarchal systems that, that have been sort of erected are still very present. And so, right, that's that's the problem. Is this is what I mean about infection or about it being in the water? It's like, what can you possibly do? It's simply there. Podobny temat pojawia się również w antologii, w zbiorze opowiadań, w opowiadaniu prawdziwe kobiety mają ciała. Ponieważ ta fraza prawdziwe kobiety też właśnie pojawia się w dyskursach internetowych i doprowadza mnie do szału, bo prawdziwe kobiety robią to, to i to i to. I nagle okazuje się, że jestem nieprawdziwą kobietą i co w związku z tym? Mogę przestać płacić podatki? <laughs> yeah. Yes, you can stop paying your taxes. You have to pay taxes. Yeah, taxes are what's not real anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so funny because the idea that That, that story came from, well, it came from a bunch of places, but one of the, th the title for the story came from this expression that, of course, people say, like, real women have curves, right? Which, like, I, it's, like, weird because it's, like, a sentiment that I feel like people say to, like, counteract fat phobia, but then it also, like, creates, it's, like, yeah, the idea of, like, real women doing anything. I think the idea that women is, like, a universal category of experience is just, like, so incredibly stupid because it's, like, There, there are so many other sort of pieces of our lives that like mean something to us that like are going to create their own experiences. And so like there are certainly shared experiences because of patriarchy, but also, you know, there's so many sort of distinct sort of intersections of identity that I think are really, that are like really meaningful and important. And I feel like language like real women also becomes like very transphobic. Like there's just ways in which that language, it just doesn't serve anybody. And so it became like this interesting sort of, You know, then I was imagining a version of that, which is like, real women have to have bodies. So then I imagine a world where like women stop having bodies, like they're, they fade away and become just these sort of like ethereal spirits. Um, so yeah, it's like a weird, yeah, it's like, I mean, I feel like, I feel like also a lot of my work is like me arguing with something. And I feel like that was me arguing with that phrase. Do you know what I mean? Like, I was just like, I don't like that. And I'm going to fight with it via a short story, um, which is what I did. Ta właśnie uniwersalizacja kategorii kobiety, głównie w celach politycznych, przez feminizm, jest też o tyle problematyczna, że właśnie jest problematyczna słowo klucz, że właśnie z historią feminizmu wiąże się cała kategoria następnych wykluczeń, tak? Jak, kim są prawdziwe kobiety? Kobiety białe, kobiety zamężne, kobiety z określonej klasy społecznej, potem, okej, okay, dobra, inkludujemy kobiety czarne, kobiety queerowe. I teraz mamy wielką walkę o wyparcie z ruchu feministycznego trans kobiet, co w ogóle jest największą plagą internetu i kultury politycznej ostatnich lat, a, ty, a tytuł, a zróbcie tego tytułu jest trudne, bo zażarta jest konkurencja. E, więc mamy te wszystkie te wykluczenia i też właśnie to, że patriarchat osadza się na tym kategoryzowaniu kobiet i nastawieniu ich przeciwko sobie. To jest mój główny zarzut, zarzut do tej właśnie teorii homospołeczności u Sedwik, która u kobiet ma być taka nieproblematyczna, bo kobiety nieustannie się dzielą albo są dzielone w ramach patriarchatu przez rasę, klasę, pochodzenie społeczne, stopień bycia pożądaną, bo to jest bardzo istotne również, w swoje właśnie powodzenie na rynku matrymonialnym, seksualność i tak dalej. I to, co mnie urzekło właśnie w Głębi Lasu, w komiksie, jest to budowanie kobiecej solidarności. Mamy bardzo różnorodne bohaterki, które są połączone wspólnym interesem. I właśnie ta solidarność pomiędzy nimi sprawia, że patriarchat, który z kolei właśnie opiera się na męskiej solidarności, zostaje wreszcie może nie zgładzony, ale przynajmniej jego podwaliny są pokruszone. Yeah, you know, it's so, a couple of years ago I read this memoir of, um, or like a non-fiction book about the Lesbian Avengers, which was this, this American lesbian activist group in like the 70s and 80s. And it was about like the rise of and fall of this group. And you know, ultimately what drove them apart was things like conversations about race, where like it just completely tore the group apart and they don't exist anymore. And I remember having this like revelation reading it, thinking about, you know, why like progressive movements sort of struggle in the way that they do. And I think, as, you know, in the US especially, I mean, like right now, we're also in this moment of like, you know, deep sort of fascism, right wing. I mean, it's very bad. And it's frustrating because I feel like my whole life I've been watching 
the right wing in the United States like move towards this like like move towards these goals of like limiting access to abortion, trying to suppress gay rights, you know, transpho like tr I mean all of these things have been like these movements that have been happening. And I had this series of revelations, one of which was right, like when we when we create these categories, it's like they w you know, the patriarchy, white supremacy, those things are served by creating these categories and then making people fight with each other. So it's like we're gonna like you know, we're gonna tell women like, or we're gonna like create these categories where like white, you know, white women are gonna like create these kinds of divisions in the group. And like, you know, we're gonna have cis women say like the trans women are not real women. And so we're gonna have these, this fight. And we, yeah, right. And like, it's like, th that only serves fascism. That only serves the right way. Like that, like those things are served by that level of division. And I feel like I also always forget and then have to remember that like fascism, white supremacy, like, like those groups, like that is, it serves the most narrow category of person possible, right? It is like serving like cis, straight, white, heteropatriarchy. And that is why they can be so efficient because they're so focused on what they're doing because they're representing this very tiny sort of representation of people. And like progressive movements, left wing movements, I mean, they, you know, struggle in a lot of ways, but like also it's like you have this big tent of people. You have like lots of people who like need help and like need support and need advocates. And there's just, it's just this like really weird tension of like fascists are served by their own fashion, like they're served by their own narrowness. Like they're served by it. It makes it easier for them to do the thing that they're trying to do. And so for me, like, Right, like these categories that get created, these divisions that get done, it's like really frustrating to watch because it's like this is literally how we die. Like this is how we die, is like these categories are made, these artificial sort of like barriers are erected and like we fight each other instead of helping each other. And then you end up with like, I mean, you end up with like, you know, in the United States, like having like abortion access being like just removed like constantly and it's like terrifying, right? So like. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's. I don't know how to fix it. This is what I mean by pessimism, because I'm like, I can see it. I can tell what I'm looking at. I know what I'm seeing. And I also have no idea how to fix it or make it better. And I just feel depressed. So, yeah. Same. <laughs> Wracałam tutaj do tego, o czym mówiliśmy chwilę temu, ponieważ e, ten właśnie bardzo teraz już dominujący tak naprawdę język polityczny jest językiem w uproszczonym, skierowanym do konkretnych odbiorców z konkretnymi odpowiedziami, który oferuje proste rozwiązania i dlatego jest taki chwytliwy i nośny. A tymczasem właśnie te lewicowe, progresywne dyskursy mówią, że życie jest skomplikowane, życie jest trudne, nie ma jednej słusznej odpowiedzi i to sprawia, że nie są nośne wśród szerokich mas, no bo trzeba je tłumaczyć od nowa i od nowa. I to też podoba się właśnie w twoich opowiadaniach i powieści. To są teksty, które można wracać wielokrotnie i za każdym razem znajduje się w nich coś innego. I każde kolejne czytanie Domu Snów to było przechodzenie od to jest traumatyczne, to jest inteligentne, to jest zabawne momentami, przepraszam, nie obraź się. To jest sprytne i tak dalej, i tak dalej. Natomiast też, co mnie zachwyca, to jest... W niesamowita subtelność twoich narracji, ponieważ też wracając do rezydentki tekstu, który czytam co jakiś czas, ponieważ e, wypuszcza moją własną kobietę ze strychu, e, jest właśnie to, że zaczynamy kibicować tej szalonej, uwięzionej kobiecie i mamy nadzieję, że wyjdzie. Tej, która jest zagrożeniem. Też sprawia, że te potwory patriarchatu, te szalone kobiety stają się bohaterkami. Może antybohaterkami, ale kimś, kto chce wypuścić na świat i patrzeć jak płonie. I love that. Yes, I mean, absolutely. And I think this is, I mean, not to come back to like Haunting of Hill House, which is my favorite novel of all time, but like, you know, Eleanor, it's like, it, you want her to win. Like you want her to be okay, even though she is this like deeply weird and unpleasant and unlikable woman. And you can see everybody around her like recoiling in horror, but like, I want her to run the world. Like I want her to like, because I, like that is the force that I want. And I feel like, I feel like this is also like a category of person whose presence I really enjoy. I, I remember having this friend many years ago who every time I, we, we, we had like a lot of mutual friends in common. Every man that I knew could not stand her. They were like, oh, 
oh, she's the worst. She's impossible to talk to. And I was like, I want to know her more. Like every man who said she, they didn't like her, I was like, I, I want to love her. I, I, like I want this person to be in my life because I feel like that just that sense of somebody who just like made things difficult for all the right people. It just felt like that is exactly who I want to have in my life and who I want to be around me as a person. Like that feels correct. Um, so yeah. Reverse Karen. Wow, I would have meditated on that, but yes, that's very <laughs> interesting. Okay, Karen, for the force of good. I mean, actually, I do feel like this is a thing. People are familiar with this term, right? Like, yes. I understand that. Okay, so like, I feel like the idea of this term, Karen, which obviously has these like very intense like racial racialized context, and like originally was sort of being used in this very specific sort of context of like white women, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, creating chaos for men for men of color. Like, there's a very that context. However. I do feel like I know a lot of people. Like I have a friend who literally will say, like, if you are having problems, like figuring out a thing that requires the phone, like an insurance issue, she's like, I will white lady that shit. Like I will do that. I will get on the phone and I will like, I will like argue whoever I have to argue with until I, we get the solution we need to get. And I'm like, yes, use that for good. Like use <laughs> use that like stubbornness and that like weird like that intensity. Like use that for good and like it's fine. So I guess it's kind of like a reverse Karen. It's like that's what that is. Yeah. Be the be the difficult wom uh, woman. <laughs> <laughs> be the difficult woman you want to see in the world. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. E, a propos trudnych kobiet, e, w domu snów nie jest jedynym tekstem, którym wykorzystujesz te trudne doświadczenia kobiecego związku, ponieważ powstało jeszcze krótkie opowiadanie Five Stages of, of Grief, gdzie masz podobne motywy i podobną konfigurację, ale to by wygląda bardziej jak e, fantazja o zemście z dużym elementem pornografii, takie pol e, Revenge porn, jako ten subgatunek horroru, a nie jako strategia wysyłania nagich zdjęć swoich byłych. That is a really interesting way of thinking about that story. Um, I mean, I published that story, I mean, it was under a, a pen name. So initially, I mean, it was weird because I had been, there was a period in my life when I was writing erotica, or I guess porn, uh, under a, a, a different name, because I, I wasn't quite sure what, how, how I wanted my career to go. I wasn't quite sure like if I wanted my name sort of associated with just like this explicitly sexual material. Um, and then eventually I was like, I don't care. And then I just started doing it, just writing it in my fiction, and then it didn't matter. Um, but that was a story that I think, also it's so funny, because you obviously you told me about that you, because it also it hasn't been public. I don't know how you found it. It hasn't been published online in many, many years, but um, it was something very like, <laughs> um, I was really, I think, looking for a space to think about that relationship. It was fairly early on in the process. And like I said, like nonfiction with the relationship was hard, but fiction was like very, very easy because I felt like I was having all these emotions that I was trying to like figure out where they belonged and like fiction was just like a way that I was sort of catching all these feelings. And so, um, and so with like uh, uh, that story, it just, it became eroticized. Like, because I feel like, I mean, this also appears in the memoir, but like so much of that relationship, like what made that relationship so difficult was that it was this like very singular erotic experience in my life up until that point and like that's really special and that's also a reason that like people stay in bad relationships is like th that can have like a really powerful hold on you and so there was something kind of interesting to me about then getting to write I mean a, a fictional story like I mean the story is fiction um and like most of the things that are happening in there are like maybe have like seeds of like true things, but like for the most part it's me just sort of like imagining into it. But it was really interesting to like have this relationship be explicitly eroticized in the fictional story. I think it was sort of me trying to like purge or like exercise, exorcise that, um, that, that feeling or like trying to like make sense of it in some way. 
Um, Cause also it's about a woman who is like breaking up or has broken up with her partner um, and eventually like meets somebody else. And like, so there, you know, it's, it's also like the arc of a, like sort of like along the arc of my own life or my own experience of that relationship. But like, yeah, I don't know. I think there was something kind of interesting about that process. It's weird to talk about it because I haven't like no one's ever asked me and, like once about that story, which is so funny. Um, but yeah, it was it was an interesting way of I think trying to like untangle the feelings I was having about the relationship with like this sort of eroticism. Um, and then someone was like, "Do you want to write an erotic story for us?" And I was like, "Yes, I will." <laughs> and then I did. <laughs> To egzorcyzmowanie jest wprost tematem opowiadania, ponieważ właśnie główne bohaterki obie skrzywdzone przez e, byłą partnerkę e, odzyskują swoją seksualność przez to, że uprawiają te same akty, podobne akty seksualne, ale już bez niej, tylko między sobą. Ale to, co mnie najbardziej uderzyło w tym opowiadaniu, były te neurotyczne, kompulsywne maile, które miały jednocześnie wymiar bardzo e, pornograficzny i psychopatyczny. The five, the five, five stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's again, it's so weird to ask me. I'm like trying to remember the story. I literally have not read it in so long. I wrote it, Wait, like, I have it on my phone if you want to read yeah, it. I want to read it right now. <laughs> yeah, well, the one, I do remember the one that was the email. I mean, there were a lot of, I also think I was trying because it has these five, it's five stages of grief. It had these five sections. And I think that I was trying to like also, it's weird, it's funny. It has never occurred to me before this literal moment <laughs> that that was like a predecessor to in the dream house because it also has these like formal constraints. <laughs> Some academic <laughs> is gonna, or you, you write the paper, write the paper. What are you doing? This is like clearly, no, it's like so funny that you, I it's called research. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, I feel like I am truly like, yeah, that is absolutely. That was like an early experiment. Wow, you're blowing my mind right now. I'm just, okay, anyway, sorry. So yeah, so I feel like, but I feel like also like, again, like thinking about the epistolary, right? The form of like writing, not about somebody, but to somebody, which like, you know, I wasn't doing in the memoir, there's no epistolary form in, I mean, there's, I mean, there's no like me writing to this person. Like it's not, that's not what the book is about. But definitely like in the aftermath of that relationship, I was writing a lot of like unsent letters and unsent emails. And I remember actually like, a thing that I did when the relationship ended because I was so afraid that I was gonna get sucked back into it. I wrote like letters to myself also where I was like, hello, this is me on this date. Like, this is why you should not get back together with this person. Like, remember this thing, remember this thing, remember this thing, like think about this thing, like, you know? And so I feel like there was something about that form, but then again, eroticized, right? Again, like taking that sort of like, that like, way of corresponding and talking to somebody, but they're not, you're not really talking to them, you're talking to yourself. And then like transforming that and using an erotic, that as an erotic context, I think was probably what I was doing. Or maybe I was just, who knows what I was doing. I, I mean, I was 25, so I could have been doing literally anything. <laughs> <don't> <laughs> yes, tell me, tell me. This is so funny because I do, I literally just two weeks ago, I was out, I was out and a friend texted me and said, I'm at a conference, like, an Eng like a literature conference right now. Someone's giving a paper on you in front of me. I'm going to live text it to you and you tell me what you think about this paper. And so she was like giving me the context of this paper and I was like, that is so interesting. And I was like trying to figure out if I agreed, but also it doesn't matter if I agree. Like it's not right because I'm just what death of the author and all that. Like I'm just, who am I? Um, Niestety autor nie jest martwy, autor żyje ma Twittera. The only other is alive now. It, true, though luckily no Twitter anymore, thank God. Um, but yeah, no, I like only Instagram. But yeah, so I feel like I feel like the um, this this it's so funny to like have things written about you by academics. And because again, it doesn't really matter if I agree or disagree with it, but it is interesting to then see myself because like also like I am the worst person to ask about what I was thinking or what I meant or what I because I'm like, I don't know what I meant. Half of what I do is a mystery to me. I feel like I like hallucinate vividly and then, the, the, you know, I like, and then I just have written something and I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Like so much of what I do is an absolute, absolutely unknown to me in every way. Um, and so it is kind of interesting to then have people with a more removed sort of context, like be able to like look at like my body of work, like look at the things about me and like 
and be able to like then return it to me in some way. Um, or like give a, a, a context that I might not have a, the correct perspective on because I'm just like, I'm, because I'm too close to it, you know, I'm just me, so. Ale nieświadomie jesteś niesamowicie inteligentną autorką. Thank you. <laughs> This is our st stand-up comedy routine. <laughs> Be here all week. Myślę, że to dobry moment, żeby spytać, czy są jakieś może pytania w sali, czy ktoś ma pytania do autorki. Opcja zadawania pytań jest czas otwarta, możecie się zgłaszać. Na pewno ktoś podejdzie z mikrofonem. Ok, jest. Jest ktoś z mikrofonem? Tak, pan już pan idzie. Fantastycznie. So I decided to be the first with the question. So first of all, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. I have to tell you that you did the job because I am so convinced I'm gonna buy the book. So, <gasps> so it was a perfect teaser, so thank you very much. And um, yeah, the question I have, actually I have two questions, uh, but I'm gonna ask them uh, because I think that they are related somehow. So uh, in terms of um, the book and the writing process, Carmen, i have the question, um, were there anything, I mean, uh, was there anything, um, when you were writing the book, uh, any moments like, uh, okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna write about that happen, and by these moments, these things, issues stopping you, I mean, your feelings or many or, or maybe some situations where you've been hurt or you hurt other people this is the first question and uh, the second one is how did you feel once the book was finished are you are you talking about the the memoir in the dream house this the memoir or yeah okay so <clears throat> were there things that i didn't want to write about um There were certainly things that I thought about. Like, I, I mean, I would sort of write, I mean, I, t I will say that I write, I sort of always write everything first. Like, I don't really hesitate or edit myself as I'm writing, I just sort of do it. And then I think, you know, then I have to have a conversation with myself about like what stays and what goes. And with the memoir, a surprising amount, I, I'm trying to think if there's anything explicitly that I took out for some reason. And I don't, I don't really think there was. I mean, there were things that I ended up for sort of craft reasons, like kind of, you know, moving around and things like that or taking out. But like, I, there was nothing in it that I felt like I can't say this or I shouldn't say this, um, which of course was really hard because it is a book about both very difficult things happening to me and also this moment in which like I behaved in ways that are humiliating to think about, you know, and I... I, like I'm, I'm dating somebody now who like did not read the book and I asked them not to because I was like, you know, it actually, I don't, I like the idea of, of you not seeing that part of me, which was like a very young, vulnerable, very hurt part of me. And I would just rather you not know, know about that if you don't already, you know? And so that, and the fact that I did that then, I mean, I, I will say that I have a very complicated relationship with this book, which like I, I'm proud of it as like an art object. I am happy that it meant a lot to a lot of people and continues to mean a lot to a lot of people. And also a big part of me regrets writing it because it was so painful to write and it was so it's so difficult to have like crystallized this like piece of myself into history forever. I mean, I mean, and forever is a strong word because like we're all going to be climate refugees in 15 years. So I'm kind of like, what is forever in this context? But like, you know, um, which I guess my pessimism is like helpful in that way. But I, I also feel like, yeah, it was just like really hard. But like, I do feel like that, but I, I did sort of do it. And I feel like as a writer, I often just do the thing, you know, um, it rarely occurs to me to take something out for that kind of reason. Like it just never, I don't, I don't know, it doesn't occur to me to do it. Um, and then the second question, oh, was how do I feel after I finished it? I mean, I felt a tremendous sense of relief that it was over. In fact, to the point where I was really struggling at the end and I, everyone in my life was saying, ask your editor for more time. 
And I could have gotten more time. Like they would, they would have just said, like, sure, we'll just move the release date of the book. But I was like, if I have to spend one more fucking minute with this book, I am gonna lose my fucking mind. And so I I was just like powering through to get to the end. And then I also felt a tremendous depression. Like I felt a tremendous darkness like descend over me because I think when writing the book, I was realizing what I had signed up to do, which I don't think I understood when I initially sold it, when I'd sort of written a little bit of it, I don't think I fully understood what would been, what was required of me to write that book and to put that book into the world. And I was then beginning to have a sense of what that would mean for me personally, and also began imagining being on tour, talking to people. And I will say, even that did not prepare me for what it meant to be on tour and talk about that book. So like even what I imagined in my pessimistic depressed brain was like not nearly as like intense as what ended up being the reality. So yeah, I felt some sense of relief that I, it was over, that the process of writing the book was done, but also I feel like that I felt this like sense of doom, you know, cause I could just see on the horizon. I was like, oh, this is, sorry, it's a very depressing answer, but I could just like see it coming. And I was like, this is, I have made some, cho I have made choices and I re I'm regretting some of my choices, you know, which is, <laughs> I guess just life, but. Yeah, anyway, but thank you for the question. That was wonderful, thank you. And I, I just want to add one more thing that uh, 36 is, is new 20, so no worries. <laughs> I'm 37, I know what oh, I am talking about. Here. Thank you. Ktoś jeszcze? Czy jakieś pytania w sali? Proszę. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the choose your own adventure part of in the dream house because I found it the most traumatizing out of everything. Um, it really showed how um, when you're in an abusive relationship there are really no good choices to make and I wanted to know how you came up with that Lydia. That's a great question, thank you. Um, so um, early on in the process of sort of conceptualizing the memoir I had this notebook I was writing in and I had written a lot of ideas for various sections that I could imagine. And one of the things I wrote, like somewhere in that notebook, it says, gaslight the reader, question mark. And then I had circled it and like underlined it a whole bunch. So I had this idea of like, how could I create an effect? I mean, so much of writing and re what I love about it as a, as a reader and what I want to do as a writer is to create an effect in a reader where they feel like, implicated and trapped in my mind, right? And even just temporarily. And like, to me, that is the most interesting effect as a reader that I could experience, is this sense that I have been like, captured in somebody else's psyche, even for a moment. And so the idea that I could write, the idea that I would write this book that would not only explain what happened, but also create in the reader a, a, a representation of the effect of what I was experiencing was like kind of interesting to me. So the trick was like, how do I do that? Like, how do I create that effect for the reader? So I had a bunch of different ideas. Like one of the ideas I had was I could simply like scold the reader or talk to the reader, like being like, don't you remember that thing that I said when I hadn't said it? But then I got worried that people would just think that either been like a misprint or something. Um, I was traumatized because early on in my first book, there was this like batch of books that went out where like, it got really weird and like the page was went from like 40 to 150. There was just like some horrible like printing mistake. So people were like always very, so I was just like paranoid. People would just think there'd been like a printing mistake, right? So I was like, okay, how do you do this? How do you do this? I couldn't figure it out. And then I was thinking a lot about how, you know, choose your own adventure as like a sort of form or the idea of like a branching narrative where you have choices is really interesting to me because it's sort of like how if you have a child you say to a child, you never say to a child, do you want to put on a shirt? You say, do you want the red shirt or the blue shirt, right? Because then they think they have a choice. They're like, oh, I, oh, I have choices. But it's not a real choice because you don't want them to like not select wearing a shirt, right? You like, have to wear a shirt. So it's like a fake choice, right, w that you give a toddler. And a choose your own adventure novel is all, is, or a book or form is the same thing where you don't have, it's like, you're, you're like, you have two choices, but those choices have been chosen for you by somebody and all the paths are fake. And if, you know, you're always gonna end up exactly where someone wants you to end up. 
And I was like, that is what that is. That's, that's an abusive relationship, right? Where it's like you, there are no correct choices. Every choice is sort of predetermined and you're gonna follow in these paths and you're gonna follow these cycles. And I was like, that's the form I gotta use. So, and it was actually, what's weird is it was actually really late in the process. Like I, had, I was maybe two, three weeks from finishing the book. You know, it was like very close to the end. And it was like, I mean, it wasn't fun exactly because no part of the book was fun, but it was like interesting to have to like map it. You know, I had to like sketch it out like on a notebook to like make sure that all the choices made sense and that I could get, you know, that everything kind of worked. But what's interesting about that chapter is that you can, you could theoretically read that chapter forever. Like you could just go in circles over and over. Or there's, and there also are, I mean, I don't know if you saw them or if the readers, but like there also are like hidden pages in that chapter. So like, there are pages that you can get to in that chapter that you can't get to via the choices. You have to just like break the rules and just read. And if you do the, the book yells at you, it like scolds you and sends you to another page. So like I wanted the text to be hostile to the reader, even for just a moment where like you felt like you were capricious in the hands of like a capricious and terrible God, which is what being an abusive relationship is like. Right. And so I just, that became the, the sort of the formal device that for me was able to like create that experience for the reader. Um, and I was really satisfied with it. Like it felt like it did exactly the thing that I had set out to do. And I'm told by people that it's like one of the most like unnerving parts of the book. It's probably the part I get asked about the most, which is really interesting. And there was also like in the US, there's this radio program, This American Life, which is like pretty big. And like they actually did like an audio version of it, which was interesting where like, it's, I mean, it's hard to explain how they did it because it was this really weird that they had an actor do it, but it's like you're sort of getting this way, the way in which it's like this terrible cycle you can't break out of. You get it like, you know, in audio form. And then also I think for that, what's so hard and sad of that chapter is like at the end, like you do get out, but the book tells you like, this is not how it happened. But like, I'll let you pretend that you can get out, but like, it's not real, right? And I think there was just something about that weird and again infectious quality the sense of like you're stuck you can't get out even when you think you can get out you're not out you're still in it right I, I don't know it just for me it just ended up being the part of the book that felt the most like because it was formally really interesting and then also did exactly what I wanted it to do which is like be hostile to the reader and create in them this sense that they're also stuck in, in it with me even just for a moment um but yeah, I, I feel like people like th comment, comment on that chapter more than any other, which is really interesting. Um, but yeah, and I, it's funny because I actually also in the US, uh, choose your own adventure is like a trademarked term. Like it's a company that like, run, you know, and the, the show Black Mirror had done this choose your own adventure episode and got sued because they used that term and they didn't ask for permission. And so I, we emailed them and I was like, can I use it? And they were like, yes. And then they send sweet little emails to me sometimes where they're like, this is Chooseco, the company that does Choose Your Own Adventure. And they like sent me like, a little holiday card. I don't know, they're like very cute. It's really funny actually. <laughs> um, but they were like, we love how you used Choose Your Own Adventure to represent intimate partner violence. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's this really weird little like side effect of having asked them permission. I don't know, it's funny, so. Uh, generally, you have a very close culture bardzo bliski związek z kulturą popularną i w twoich tekstach widać również te nawiązania nie tylko do tradycji powieści gotyckiej, właśnie Shirley Jackson i klasyki horroru, ale też do współczesnej kultury popularnej, chociażby w e, szczególnie paskudne, jeśli dobrze pamiętam tytuł, Speciali Hines, e, w, gdzie robisz e, retelling e, Law and Order, amerykańskiego serialu procedura prawnego, E, ale w sposób, który naświetla całą skalę przemocy wobec kobiet, jaka się tam pojawia. Yeah, you know, Law and Order, do people watch Law and Order SVU here? Is that like a thing? Or? We have, pros, 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 what is language? We have similar. Like okay, that. okay. So, yeah, this, this is, is this police procedural that focuses on like sexual crimes, like rapes and sexual assaults and things. and. It's a, it's, it has like a million seasons. It's very popular in the US. And it, you know, it used to be the show where like, if you turn on a TV in a hotel, that's the show that's playing, like always. Like if you are in the US, it's like always that. Um, and it's funny because I had this very complicated relationship with it where 
I loved it, and I, I've, I've seen, especially the first, like, I mean, it's been going on now for, like, 24 seasons, but, like, the first, like, 12 or so are actually really great. Like, in terms of, like, craft of, like, the police procedural, they're, like, really, really good. Um, and also, like, incredibly, unbelievably problematic. Like, I cannot emphasize to you enough how problematic that show is. But it also really, I think, was interesting to me because it also then asked these questions of, like, I mentioned, like, implication of, like, what does it mean to be, like, a feminist who has certain thoughts about, like, narrative of sexual violence and also things like police violence to then, like, be watching the show, like, just, just, just absorbing, like, you know, hundreds of hours of this television show. Um, what does that mean? And so it's, it's this very, like, interesting dynamic. And, yeah, that short story, I think, was my attempt to, like begin to try to figure that out. So yeah, I mean, I find pop culture very interesting. Like, I love television, I love video games. Like, I, these are things that are very, a huge part of my life. And so, it may, you know, and for me, it makes sense that like, because they're such a huge part of my life, it's like, that's what I'm thinking about. That's what's on my mind. And so it makes sense that like, media that I'm consuming becomes then, like it enters into my fiction in these various ways. Because ultimately it's like, these are stories that we are, the stories that we're consuming and like, that's how I can understand like what we value, what people value, like what, you know, like that's, so yeah, so I feel like for me, pop culture is just like a, p a tool in my toolbox. It's like genre, it's like, I don't know, it's like a really interesting way of like figuring out like what we are interested in as people, the stories we tell ourselves, et cetera. E, też to opowiadanie jest po części fanfiction, ponieważ tam się e, z iż to chyba najsil, najbardziej popularny pairing e, w tym fandomie. I, I jedyny moment, kiedy dostajemy szczęśliwe zakończenie w pewnym sensie. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I didn't really write fan fiction growing up. That was not really my thing. Though I feel like everybody I know and love wrote fan fiction, but I did not. But I really find it very interesting. And it, it's true that in a story that is about mostly like the worst of humanity, I also was like, if I don't get those two together, I'm gonna lose my mind. So I was like, I'm gonna make them kiss and I'm gonna make them stay together, and it's gonna have a happy ending for just those two, none of the, no one else, but those two, absolutely. Um, and that was pretty fun, actually, to get to do that, so. Czy jeszcze jakieś pytania? Jeśli można? I wanted to say that you really well captured this complicated relationship you had with law and, law and order because I had the same feeling while I was reading the story. At first I was like, what the fuck? And then I was like, oh, like, why is it ending? And like, I had this sense of grief that like the seasons are not like going further. But my question is different, uh, actually, because you said that uh, about the resident, you said that it's um, like uh, about yourself, mostly like the main character. So I wanted to ask a question whether you have been a Girl Scout yourself. I was a Girl Scout until I was 18 years old because I am cool. <laughs> so I, yes, I can, I can make my way through the woods and I can change a tire. Uh, did, did, did we lost the sound on second mic? Oh, it has dead battery. <laughs> we need another mic. It, this one is working, but... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, what I wanted to say was that um, in general, all of your work is uh, discussing really really complicated topics like both uh, mother-daughter relationships, uh, abuse, queerness, depression, everything pretty much. So uh, do you think that, uh, my question is, do you think that writing this book helped you to uh, maybe, because you say that uh, writing uh, Dream House helped you to understand everything that you were going through and how hard actually it was to describe it, but did it actually help you to uh, accept that it happened? And mm -hmm. does it make you feel maybe not better, but uh, feel okay with the fact that it happened and at peace in some way? I wish the answer to that question was yes. Like nothing would make me happier than saying, it helped me figure out my contact. I mean, it, I guess it, it helped me figure out quite literally where I belonged in a much larger story about violence and about, you know, intimate partner violence and also about queerness. Like, I mean, it gave me context in that sense. 
I, I, I guess I cannot emphasize enough like how damaging writing this book was. And I think it was, bec you know, and I, I hate saying that, I, I hate saying that, like nothing would make me happier than being like, I felt purged, I felt cleansed, I felt better, I felt, like I, I wish I could say that. I guess I felt like I passed a kidney stone, maybe is the most accurate way of talking about it, because it's true that I was like, I had this thought where I was like, you know, I want to write this book because I want to write, I want to keep writing books. And this thing, this, this, this reality of my life, it's like looming very large in my psyche. And it would help me if I could like put it in a jar and like put it somewhere. And I think what I didn't understand was that first of all, writing the book would not put it in a jar. It would in fact smear it everywhere. And also it would sort of cement it in time or it would like, or like crystallize it. And then also, I really thought that I had sort of moved through, or like what what happened. And then I'm writing a new book now. I'm writing. Well, I'm writing a couple new books, but I'm writing this fiction book that is hopefully pray for me. It's not done. I need to finish it. But it, I have a book that I'm writing that I'm close to. But it's fiction. It's short stories. And like I was literally. And you know, I, I had sort of been working on it for a while, and I, I mean, I stopped during COVID, but I started up again. But I was like looking through it, and I was talking to a friend of mine who's been helping me, and I was saying to her, you know, I, I was trying to describe the book to my editor so I could send her this new draft, and I, I was like, well, how would you describe like the themes of this book? And my friend was like, well, I mean, it's about being in the thrall of a powerful person. It's about making the same mistakes over and over and over again. It's about being trapped and there's something huge coming toward you and you can't get out of the way. And I was like, are you fucking serious? <laughs> like, so just, it's just the fictional, ver it's just like me writing about how I can't get my shit together and how like these patterns repeat themselves. And like that made me so sad because I was like, I really thought that I was gonna like sit down and write fiction about. So now as a result, the next book I'm writing is just a deeply horny book because I was like, I need to move as far away from this material as human. I wanna write like the, I wanna write the most life affirming horny book I could possibly write in my whole life. And so that's the next step, hopefully. Again, pray for me. But I feel like there was something about realizing that like this thing was still here, was still there that like was really uh, sort of difficult to like comprehend. And again, like I, I hate to say this and I wish that I had a better or more satisfying or more optimistic answer, but it was just a really difficult process. And um, I, you know, I can't go back in time and undo it and it is what it is. And I'm also, again, like I said, proud of the book. You know, I'm glad it exists. I, you know, I'm glad that it's doing good work and also it makes me really sad. And I think that there's just no amount of like anything that's gonna make that feeling go away. Or I feel like it would have already. I mean, also again, like, I you know, I toured that book and then COVID happened. So then like we all entered into this like massive depression, like all together, right? As we all like had this like life changing thing happen to every single person on, on the earth. And so I feel like that also did not help things certainly. Cause I had, I think I had no moment to also like breathe and like recover. Cause it was just like wrote this really hard thing went to a bunch of places and talked with a lot of people about it. And then suddenly I was locked in my house indefinitely as this like awful thing ravaged the globe. So like, it's just like a weird, it's just been like a weird few years, honestly. Sorry, uh, sorry. If this per question is too personal, but did anyone uh, you know recognize themselves in any of your books, and what was the let's call it feedback from them? <laughs> um. <sighs> if you write. I mean, the memoir, it's like a memoir, so like, yes, there are people that are in that book, whatever. But for fiction, people recognize themselves all the time. Are they correct? Yeah, like 40% of the time they're correct. They're correct like sometimes. Um, yeah, like people appear, I mean, I was, and also I wrote a memoir which like had real people in it, obviously. Um, yeah, I guess I can say that 
I am not particularly like if people have feedback from like I'm not I'm not in the business of receiving feedback for published books. So like when I'm writing a book, I'm obviously like, you know, giving it I mean, I have people who are reading it with me, I have editors, I have like there's like it's a very whole process, right? And once a book is in the world, it's in the world. And I'm not really particularly interested in what people have to like I'm not I'm like I don't know. Yeah. So like yes, people have been like Oh, I, I, is this me? And I'm like, I mean, maybe, but also like, it's fiction, right? Like, fiction is fiction, and like, I don't know. I'm a writer. I mean, I, and I guess you know, fiction writers have this way of writing where I mean, I'm like a little raccoon, and I like, I'm just constantly, and I have a little satchel in this situation, which actually raccoons don't have satchels, so I don't know why I said that, but like, I'm like a little creature, and I'm just like constantly like, I'll take that, and I will take that, and I will take that, and I will take that, and like, that's just how I write. Like, I just am absorbing everything around me constantly, and like, people tell me stories, and I meet people, and like, they be, they enter into my work, and like, that is, the, if you meet writers, or you are friends with writers, or you are related to writers, I'm sorry to say that is just the reality. They'll become the reality of your life as well, which is that like. If you say something that's kind of interesting or you behave in a certain way, you might end up in a book. And that is just, but also that is like how we have written fiction forever. That's just like what it means to be a writer or to be, to know writers um, and other artists as well, right? And so, so yeah, so people have had thoughts that I have like heard in a literal sense and they have gone out the other, cause I'm just like, I mean, yeah, it's, I don't know. I write. I write what I write. I'm proud of what I write. I think I'm good at what I do. And I don't know. I'm not particularly interested in like people's responses or feedback in that way. Like, whatever. Um, that's again. That's just me. Different writers will have different answers to that question. But I. I just because I think there's something too about like you can't. It's like that. That is the process. That's what writing is. And also, it's impossible to receive that level of feedback from people. Const people are always going to have feelings about what you've written, especially if they think that they're in it or that there's some representation of themselves that is appearing in the book. And I think that's like a discomfort with like being seen. You know, I think it's like weird to be seen, and it's weird to have somebody have a perspective on your behavior that like might maybe feels. I mean, whatever how it feels, but like I think that people just get weird about being seen. And so I think that that's their discomfort with it. So. Uh, stomatozowałaś to w sumie w opowiadaniu uh, Difficult at, at the Parties, gdzie uh, bohaterka doznała, uh, przeżyła gwałt, doznała przemocy seksualnej i próbuje wyjść z tego, oglądając pornografię, co jest w sumie jedną z polecanych metod terapeutycznych. Zobaczenie to nie seksu w innym kontekście niż przemoc, ale też drugim ważnym elementem opowiadania poza tym jest właśnie obiektyw aparatu, kamery, którym, który przynosi na przyjęcie, ponieważ ona zaczyna słyszeć myśli osób uprawiających seks. Z prawdopodobnie najbardziej niezręczną sytuacją towarzyską, jaka może spotkać człowieka, bo są najbardziej prywatne momenty, których... Nie chcę, żeby słyszeli, co myślimy. E, I w pewnym momencie ten obiektyw staje się dla niej czymś niesamowicie przerażającym na przyjęciu. Jakie jest to połączenie właśnie pomiędzy obiektywem a e, traumą i seksualnością? Such a good question. Oh. Sorry, I, I feel like <laughs> you've asked me so many questions I've never been asked before. This is like mind blowing to me. This is amazing. Um, Thank you for review. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> If you wanted my feedback. Um, yeah, no, I feel like there's something about like, I mean, the eye of the camera, the eye of the artist, like the eye of the writer, like that sort of level of interrogation, I think is like really difficult for people to comprehend if you do, do not experience it yourself, yourself. So like, this is actually reminding me of this essay there was this great, okay, sorry, like I'm like, how do I get not too in the weeds with this conversation? So like, d did you guys have like cat person here? Did that like go viral in the same, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. The short story, okay. So people were having these conversations last year about like what it means to have this like big short story come out and then somebody say like, I'm the person in that short story. And like, it was a very weird conversation to be sure, but one of the more interesting bits that came out of it was there was this essay that got published in like, some American magazine by this poet, Molly Fisk, who talks about how her uncle, so her like father's sisters was married to John Updike, this like American writer. 
and her father had died when she was like a teenager and John Updike had written a short story that appeared in a magazine, like a very famous magazine, um, about, it, it seemed to be about her father. Like the, her father was a character in this uh, short story. But in the short story, the character that was her father was also a pornographer, like he made pornography. And it was like very shocking and the family was furious. They were like, how dare you like write about this man you, how dare you put him in a short story and then make him a pornographer? Like, we're so mad at you. And she was also really furious because she had loved her father and she had lost her father and this was like so horrible. Many, many years later, she writes her first book of poetry and she realizes, at, as she's like doing the work writing this poetry, she remembers and realizes that her father molested her as a child. She like has this memory and she realizes that she, and she's and writing in this book about this molestation. And at that point, John Updike is no longer married to her aunt, but she sends this in this book anyway. And she's like, you know, here's this book, my first book. And he reads it and he sends her a letter and he says, you know, he was like, you know, thank you for sending me your book. I loved it, it was so beautiful. He was like, it was really hard and sad to read this stuff about your father. And he said, you know, when you were a child, I remember like seeing an interaction between you and your father that like really troubled me. And I don't think I understood or realized exactly what I was looking at, but I now realize that's what I was seeing. And he was like, that was sort of the thing I was trying to represent in this short story. And like what she, and what she says in this essay is like, that's what a writer does, is a writer is writing toward truth, a fiction writer even, is writing toward truth in a evil, but with fiction, with like, with like, not lies, but like functionally with lies, right? Like made up stuff. And it's like, he's so good at what he did that he like saw something, it like bothered him. It was like a little grain of sand, right? And he was, it was like bothering him and bothering him and bothering him. And he wrote a short story that like didn't quite get it right, but got really close, right? Where he was like, there's something like odd about the sexual, there's something sexualized and odd going on here. And he like kind of wrote toward it and like got pretty close. And I was like, there's no better for me encapsulation of like the weirdness of what fiction is, the weirdness of being a fiction writer and like using this mix of like stuff you invent, stuff you see, stuff other people tell you, your own life. And like you create this like weird mix and like you end up ideally close to some essential truth about something. And like that is what we are called to do. And it is crazy to explain it out loud. We're like, what do you do? And you're like, well, I mix up hallucinations I have, my own life, other people's shit, and then I put it on the page and then people pay me for it. And I try to figure out truth. Like that's a crazy way to describe the thing that you do, but that is what we do, or that's what we try to do, right? Ideally, that's what you're doing. And so I feel like there's something, sorry, I'm like way away from the question that you asked, I apologize. But like, I feel <laughs> like there's something in there that I think is so essential and interesting about like this process um, that to me just feels like this is why we make art. I mean, this is why art exists, is like you're trying to like get at something true and essential about human existence or life or whatever it is and like you're trying to make that clear um i've already forgotten your i've forgotten your question entirely i don't it feels <laughs> like i got close to the answer maybe but yeah anyway yep uh, to opowiadanie przypomniało mi się kiedy oglądałam uh, Jordana Pila najnowszy film Nope który też jest właśnie o tej relacji pomiędzy patrzeniem, oglądaniem i przemocą i o tym jak patrzenie jest aktem przemocy i uh, Musiałam sobie aż przeczytać to pytanie jeszcze raz, jak wróciłam z kina. Ponieważ dla mnie to jest prawie ta sama historia, tylko mam do czynienia z przemocą rasową i przemocą seksualną. Ale one z sobą bardzo dobrze korespondują. To będzie mój kolejny artykuł. Yes, please, yes, absolutely write that article. No, I think that it's funny. You're absolutely right. And that is what that, that is like a central theme of that film. And I do feel like it's like watching can be a kind of violence and seeing is almost a way of like puncturing the violence and those things exist sort of in tandem with each other. And I think it's like, it, there's something really interesting in there. Again, yeah, sorry, write that article. Yeah, what am I saying about it? I don't know, but yeah, write the article, please. <laughs> I will tell you what you are saying in the story after I write the article. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. jakieś pytania? Chyba widzę, że musimy powoli kończyć. O, proszę. 
Okay, um, good evening. I would like to ask a question. Um, so how do you feel about the purpose or the reason why you write? I mean, is it because uh, you feel that the world should uh, hear about the topics that you mention in your books? Or is it more like an internal feeling that you have so many emotions and experiences that you just have to uh, pour them on paper and that's some kind of therapy for you maybe? And I just wanted to know how you feel about it. That's a great question. I mean, I think, I would definitely say it's not therapeutic. I feel like if you're writing for therapeutic purposes, it's, it, it's just, just, I feel like therapeutic writing, I mean, the act of writing can be literally therapeutic, but I think that like writing for an audience, like writing work that you want people to read, I think is like, should not be therapeutic. Um, it should be hard and weird, but I, I do think that like, for me, this question of like, am I writing to like make a point about patriarchy or am I writing in response to the violence of patriarchy? I would say it's the latter. I would say it's like, I'm writing in response to my existence and like, and, and it feels, I mean, it feels very natural to me to write. Like I, I feel like when I write, um, it, it's, or it's like I, I organize my thoughts with writing and I always, I have for a very long time and so, you know, even when I'm having an experience, I'm like, in some way my brain is already beginning to shape it or like put, like figure it out in like a narrative context because my body just does that kind of, auto my brain does it automatically. Um, and I feel like sometimes people do want to write for like, I guess more didactic reasons or they want to like make a point or they want to like say a thing about a thing. And that's like a kind of political writing that I think has its own value in its own place. But for me, I am really interested in like, it's like coming up out of me. It's like I'm vomiting it. I mean, it's like not to be gross. I mean, guess to be gross, yes, it's gross. But like, it is this sense of like, I have something inside of me and it has to be out and like I need to find it. And that is the place that I find for it. I think that people do this. I think this is true of everybody. I think everyone does this in different ways. But I think that like, there's this way in which art can be like, the bowl catching the vomit. I don't know, it's disgusting. But it's like there is, it, it's like this, it is like very internal for me. It's very like, you know, this is my, this is how I exist, this is my life. And for some reason, the form of writing is just the place, it's like the shape that it's taking. It's like the thing that I need to have. Um, yeah, but I feel like it's, yeah, that's often what it is. I mean, people I think will have responses to it that can be like, oh, this is telling me something or teaching me something which is fine, people can have whatever reaction they want to it, again, it's like not really for me to say what people's response to it is, but I also, for me, it is like super internal, and it's just like I think I can't imagine not doing, like I, I do it so automatically, it's like breathing, and I, even if I never got, even if I never sold another book in my life, even if I never, you know, I would still write, I would still do it, even if there was like, I was the last person alive on earth, I would still be writing because I feel like it's just so natural to me. Jeszcze jakieś pytania? Tam z tyłu? Okay, sorry, I'll try to be quick. So my question is about writing uh, literature about women and about women's issues, and maybe not just literature, just any other piece of media, basically. Um, you know, I think that the people who are the most interested in reading uh, books about women and discussing the issues that they have are actually women themselves. Um, and I think that uh, it kind of creates this situation where Mm, where where the only people who discuss women's issues are women, and the the like the circle of discussion is kind of closed, uh, and maybe this this makes women like have maybe less agency or maybe less uh, less capability to actually mm, do some changes to actually mm, prove their point to men because their 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 opinions, their their statements, and their involvement. I think it's also important, but usually it's like, you know, it's men are much less involved in discussions about women and sometimes even like, at least from my experience, men are, sometimes they even see 
women's issues as like you know merely a joke, and it's and it's awful. You know, of course it's not all men, but I think, I think yeah, it's still. <laughs> You don't have to say that. It is all. It is. It is all men. It's okay. You can say it. It's so, fine. You can say it. It's all men. Yeah. So, like, my question is, what do you think about it? And maybe, how can literature or the books you write, how can they make the situation better, or you know, do anything about it? That's a really great question. Um, so I agree with you entirely. I mean, I think that like. You know, this has been borne out in many ways. Like, even from a young age, like, I, they did a study in the US years ago where they found that, like, girls will read books about any gender. Like, the protagonist can be a boy or girl, doesn't matter. But boys only want to read books about boys, right? And so the, there are people are always like, how do we get more boys to read? We need to ha hire more male authors to write books about boys. And it's like, yeah, but what, why? But like, there's a reason that they're not reading. It's because like, boy, it, you know, it's like so frustrating because it's like even from a very young age, boys are socialized to believe that women's stories don't matter, and that continues only into adulthood, right? Um, and it's like reminds me also of how people tell me all the time they'll say like, oh, I teach your story, the husband stitch in school, like you know, at the university level, and like the boys are also so quiet. They're always so quiet during those classes. Um, and the women are always like really engaged and like wanna have a whole conversation about it. And I think that like you're like you're correct, and it's really frustrating. And the question is, what do you do about a thing like that? Because it's like, and I think this also is is getting at this like problem that I think I'm also trying to write about a lot, which is like obviously the ways in which patriarchy like actively ruins women's lives is like really horrible. But I think there's also a kind of benign neglect that also happens, where then you have like good men or men who are not actively trying to like dismantle women's rights, but who are also like not sure what to do and they're like kind of removed from the conversation. Or they think like, oh, if I'm not actively hurting women in my day-to-day -day life, then like I'm fine, right? But of course that, that isn't enough, right? It's not enough to not hurt somebody. There's like all these other sort of ways in which men, which who I agree are necessary to like dismant, I mean, they're part, they're the problem, right? But they need to be dismantling, but they simply won't or they can't, but they choose not to. So the question becomes like, what do you do about a thing like that? I mean, is there art? I mean, how does art or literature do that? I honestly can't say. I mean, I, I w again, I wish I had the answer. I wish I could say like, oh, it's, it's this and this, but I don't think it's that simple. I think that a way that I know that I'm getting older and I'm getting more radical is like, I'm beginning to think that like, sorry, I'm like, how do I not frame this in a way that's like terrifying? Separatus płciowy lat 70 nie był złym pomysłem? <laughs> it's not even gender separatism, it's literally like, if they won't give us the rights that we need, we will take them by force. Like, it's like, it's like, and I think this is true of like, all, not just gender, but I think this is true of like all right, where it's like, I feel like there's this frustrating thing where we are forced to do this like very polite dance, where we're like, please let us have these rights, please let us live, please let us exist, please, please, please. And it is demeaning and dehumanizing and ultimately ineffective, right? Because again, the aforementioned like fascist creep, I mean, it's, you know, it's all these problems, right? And I do feel like, I feel like the headline tomorrow is gonna be like, American writer advocates for like violent overthrow of patriarchy, which like is not incorrect. Like I, <laughs> I, I feel like there is something like a little bit like, like I just, and I think that people will say things like violence is not the answer or whatever, and I'm like, I'm not sure that's actually true. Like, I think there is actually like, you Depending know. Depending on the question. What was that? Depending on the question. <laughs> right, I mean, that's, I mean, right. It's, there's something about like, it, it's like, I, again, and I don't know if it's just my cynicism where I'm like, I'm watching these like political systems fail, like fail in these profound ways that like are so depressing. And I feel like there is a way in which it's like, this is why people have to go to the streets. This is why people have to like be out. And like, actually, I was just talking to some friends of mine, some Polish friends of mine earlier today, and they were showing me photos of the demonstrations from like the abortion, like the um, abortion access 
photos of like those protests. And it was like incredible to see these images. It was like so heartening. And also be, it's been very depressing like in the US, like you know, we had this like Roe v. Wade was overturned recently. Abortion access is becoming even more limited day to day. And there just isn't the amount of turnout that you would want at these protests because I feel like people are exhausted and like whatever, there's all kinds of reasons why. But I feel like ultimately it's like you have to be in the streets putting your body on the line for these things that really matter because ultimately like being nice, playing nice, playing to the politicians, putting on a pretty face, you know, begging men to give you rights, begging men to like let you live, begging like begging white people to like ex allow you to exist, begging the police not to kill you, like ultimately these things will not work. Like they will not work. They have never worked, right? And so I feel like there is on some level a kind of action which I cannot give a specific sort of like language to, so I don't want to be like arrested. Um, but I but I feel like there is something about like I think we are thinking about this in really polite terms, and I feel like the time for politeness is like way behind us. And I again, I wish I did not believe that. Like I wish I believed that there were like ave avenues that like felt more accessible. But I honestly. I don't, I don't know, you know? And I, I, I just, and I feel like too, there's also this piece of it which is like, it's like we talk about these, these political issues, so things in the, like, you know, abortion rights or trans rights or whatever, or, or you know, uh, police violence and like racial rights, in, in these like very abstract terms, and it's like people are dying. Like people are dying. Women are dying because they do not have access to legal abortion. Black people are dying because in the US the police are killing them in like incredible numbers. Like trans people are dying because they don't have access to like the resources they need. And like that is a very real situation. And like I don't know how any response to that is not like we need to be out there in this like doing the thing. Because I feel like this like polite desire to like rhetoric your way out of it is like just so it's like people are dying right now, like as we speak. And I don't know what else to say about that, except that that's really bad, and it shouldn't be that way, and like we should be doing everything we have to do in our powers to like make that not happen. Czy ktoś ma jakieś pytanie nie prowadzące do przewrotu politycznego? Bo myślę, że to jest dobry moment, żeby zakończyć dyskusję, zanim w, w, różne władze od obecną e, Akademii Sztuk Teatralnych finansowanie zagłoszone tu treści. Co nie jest niewyobrażalne w naszym obecnym systemie politycznym. E, więc chciałabym serdecznie podziękować Carmen za rozmowę. E, było to niesamowicie, było to, było to niesamowicie pozytywne, e, sympatyczne, intelektualne i e, zabawne przeżycie. Chciałabym podziękować wszystkim Państwu tutaj za Waszą obecność i oczywiście podziękować Fundacji Tygodnika Powszechnego i e, Festiwalowi Konrada za umożliwienie tego spotkania. Przypominam, że książki będą podpisywane w foyer e, przy tym stoisku z książkami, również można nabyć książki autorki. I jeszcze raz serdecznie dziękuję za ten przemiły wieczór i przepraszam za wszystkie moje błędy i potknięcia. Wszystko co dobre to Carmen, a co złego to ja się nie wyspałam. Dziękuję bardzo. Thank you, everybody.